fresh water on Earth. About 76% of Earth's fresh water is in glaciers, so that's that big blue section. More than three quarters of the fresh water on Earth is locked up in ice. About 24% of the fresh water is found in groundwater, so that's that orange piece of the pie. Groundwater includes any water that's found in rocks and soils underground. But the water that we all see most regularly is in lakes and streams, and this is water that's called surface water. So you might be able to see that really little gray sliver on the gra graph, and that represents all the freshwater lakes in the world. So lakes make up about three-tenths of a percent of fresh water on Earth. Rivers make up an even smaller portion of the fresh water. So rivers make up about four thousandths of a percent of the fresh water on Earth. So what this means is that there's very little fresh water on Earth, and only a small percentage of that fresh water is actually accessible to us as ground and surface water. So why should we care about these freshwater ecosystems? Despite how little fresh water there is, we rely really heavily on it in many parts of our lives. We get drinking water from groundwater sources like aquifers and surface water sources like lakes. We use huge amounts of groundwater and surface water for irrigating crops and growing food. We also use surface water for recreational purposes like fishing, swimming, and boating. In many parts of the world, including where I live in the Midwestern United States, freshwater recreation like fishing is a huge part of the economy. Here you can see maps of the eight biggest cities in the United States based on population. The cities are marked by the red dots, and then the blue lines represent major streams and rivers. Almost every one of these cities is built on or near a river. The only exception is New York City, but New York still relies heavily on rivers because their drinking water is pumped into the city from rivers in upstate New York. So clearly, we rely heavily on fresh water. And given how closely tied our life is to fresh water, it's important for us to understand these ecosystems and how to keep them healthy. One key to understanding these freshwater ecosystems is to understand what animals live in those ecosystems. I could spend literally 100 lectures talking about all the animals that live in freshwater. There are over 100,000 species living in freshwater. The first type of animal most people think of when they imagine lakes and rivers are fish. There are over 15,000 species just fish living in freshwater for either all or part of their lives. This means that nearly half of all spe fish species in the world live in fresh water, despite the fact that fresh water takes up so much less surface water than the oceans. Freshwater fish come in all shapes and sizes. So on the left here, you can see uh, a rainbow darter, and these fish get their names because the males have these brightly colored stripes of all colors. In the middle, you see an alligator gar, which is one of the largest freshwater fishes in North America. Alligator gar commonly grow to be about six feet long and 100 pounds. And then on the right, you have a family of fish that shows just how diverse fish can really be. So these are, this is a family called the cichlids. And even cichlids living in a single lake can have huge variation in shape and size and color. And that picture just shows you some of the types of cichlids that are out there. Turtles are another common animal to find living in freshwater ecosystems. So here you see uh, a spiny soft shell turtle, which is one of my favorite species of turtle, uh, and then a common map turtle. And then along with turtles, there are a number of other reptiles that live in or rely on freshwater ecosystems like streams and lakes. Water snakes, for example, spend a lot of their time living and hunting in the water. And here you can see a Lake Erie water snake, which is a species that's found pretty regularly near where I live, uh, up in Lake Erie. Many species of amphibians, like frogs and salamanders, also rely really heavily on streams and ponds, which is another important freshwater ecosystem. Uh, on the left here, you can see a type of salamander called a hellbender. And this is not the kind of salamander you're used to seeing. It's not one of those little ones. Hellbenders can usually grow to be about a foot long, but in some cases can be as long as two feet. And they have this particularly slimy skin, which has earned them the very endearing nickname of snot otter. Pictured in uh, the other two pictures here show two examples of another important freshwater animal, which is the crayfish, or also called the crawdad in many places. 
So there are over 500 species of crayfish in the world, most of which actually live in North America. I think it's something like 405 of those species live in North America. I spend a lot of time studying crayfish. It's one of the main species that I study. So I'd love to talk about them all day. In fact, all of these groups deserve an entire lecture devoted entirely to them. And these are just a subset of the animals living in fresh water. But I wanna move on and focus on a group of species that's especially unique and important in freshwater ecosystems. This group is the emergent insects. So most of you probably recognize one or two of these species. From left to right, we have a mosquito and then a damselfly, which is closely related to dragonflies. And then on the right, we have a mayfly. All of these are emergent insects. Emergent insects are species that live part of their life in the water before they metamorphosize into an insect that lives on land. So each of these insects has a larval stage that lives in the water. Emergent insects all have a pretty similar life cycle, so I'm going to go over the dragonfly just as an example. So here you have a dragonfly. Adult dragonflies will lay their eggs on plants in or near the water. Those eggs will then hatch into larvae that live in the water. Some groups of emergent insects, like mosquitoes, have more than one life stage that lives in the water, but others, like dragonflies, only have one. When living in the water, dragonfly larvae are actually really voracious predators. They'll eat just about anything smaller than them, including other insect larvae and even small fish. Most dragonfly larvae live in streams for about one to two years, and then they'll emerge from the water to become adults. And most species only live as adults for about a week or two before they lay their eggs and die. Mayflies have an even more dramatic life cycle. So larvae will spend maybe a few months to a year living in the water, but once they emerge and become adults, they'll live anywhere from a few hours to maybe a few days. Most of the mayfly species live such a short time as adults that as adults, they don't even have mouth parts because they don't even bother to eat as adults. The, when once they emerge, the adults will mate, lay eggs, and die within a day or two. Because mayflies live for such a short time as adults, they need to be able to make sure they can find a mate once they emerge from the water. So they developed an adaptation to ensure they'll be able to find another mayfly before they die. So all the mayflies in a stream or lake will emerge at the same time to maximize their chance of finding one another in the short time that they're alive as adults. In some areas, so many mayflies will emerge from the water all at once that you can actually see them on weather radar. So here what you're looking at is a mayfly emergence from the Mississippi River in Wisconsin. And so these are, emergences are huge events. But one thing I want you to think about is that we're so used to seeing these insects on land, but in reality, insects like dragon, damsel, and mayflies, they actually spend a larger portion of their lives in the water than they do on land. So these insects need healthy streams and lakes in order to survive. Now I know that in general, insects tend not to be people's favorite animals. And I'm sure there are at least some of you out there thinking that maybe we'd be better off without them in the first place. But these emergent insects actually play a really important role, not just in streams, but also in marine and terrestrial ecosystems. So here you see two types of emergent insects living on the bottom of a stream. There's a caddisfly and a mayfly. As larvae, emergent insects are an important food source for larger animals living in streams. So this includes fish, crayfish, reptiles, amphibians, pretty much anything that's bigger than them in the stream. But this relation affects not just, this relationship affects not just streams, but also oceans, because there's a group of fish called anadromous fish. And these fish live in streams as juveniles and then live in the ocean as adults. The most common example of an anadromous fish is salmon. So salmon will spend up to two years living in a stream before they migrate into the ocean. As adults, salmon will then swim back up the river where they were born to lay their own eggs. As juveniles, salmon eat almost exclusively emergent insect larvae in streams. So in order for oceans to have healthy salmon populations, streams have to have healthy insect populations for those salmon to feed on as juveniles. When these insects emerge from streams as adults, they also provide food for a number of terrestrial species. Frogs, for example, eat a lot of these emergent insects. 
Some species of bats and birds are also called aerial insectivores, which means that they catch and eat insects while flying. And emergent insects make up a really important part of many of these species' diets. And then there are also species of spiders that build their webs next to streams specifically to catch emergent insects as they're coming out of the water. So any changes to the types or the amounts of insects emerging from streams has huge impacts for all of these species that feed on those insects. So emergent insects provide a really important connection between streams, oceans, and terrestrial ecosystems. Now, another really interesting characteristic of these emergent insects is that they can be used as indicators of whether a body of water is healthy. The animals living in a stream vary in how tolerant they are of bad conditions in the water. Worms, for example, are really tolerant of problems like pollution and dirty water. Most animals fall somewhere in between tolerant and intolerant. But there's a group of emergent insects that are particularly tolerant of harsh conditions in the water. And this group includes caddisflies, stoneflies, and mayflies. And these species are particularly vulnerable when streams and lakes get disturbed or polluted. So these species can be used as bioindicators to determine whether the water is healthy. If you find lots of these species in a stream, chances are the stream is pretty healthy if they're able to survive. But if the species aren't present in a stream, there's a good indicator that the stream might be polluted or in some other way degraded which is making it difficult for those species to survive. The US EPA surveys streams throughout the United States by looking at what types of animals live in the water. So they focus on these aquatic insects, crayfish, snails, and worms, and look at what's living in the water to judge whether the water is healthy. From this assessment, they determined that 46% of rivers and streams in the, in the United States are in poor condition. So this means almost half of the streams in the U.S. aren't healthy. 25% of the streams they studied uh, were in fair condition and 28% were in good condition. So the next step is for us to understand well, what causes these streams to be so unhealthy. One, in, one of the leading causes of stream degradation is nutrient pollution. The EPA study showed that greater than 40% of streams in the U.S. suffered from nutrient pollution. The second leading cause of unhealthy streams is poor habitat quality. So I'm gonna talk about each of those problems and then I'm gonna talk about what we can do about them. What can we do to help? Nutrient pollution can kind of sound like a paradox since nutrients are necessary for life. All forms of life need nutrients to survive, to grow, to reproduce. Without those nutrients, there would be no life at all in streams or anywhere else. Two key nutrients that are especially important are nitrogen and phosphorus. And these nutrients are available naturally. So humans and other animals get nitrogen and phosphorus and other nutrients from the foods that we eat. Plants get these nutrients from the soil. But when it comes to nutrients, there can be too much of a good thing. When nutrient concentrations get too high in streams and rivers and lakes, you get nutrient pollution. So the problem starts when nutrients enter the water from non-natural sources. The main source for excess nutrients in fresh water is farms. So fertilizer has large amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus because plants need those nutrients to grow. But that fertilizer can also get into streams. When it rains, fertilizer washes into nearby streams and lakes, taking with it all those nutrients that were meant for the crops. Cows and other animals also contribute nutrients to fresh water. Manure from cows and other animals has lots of nutrients in it, like nitrogen, because they haven't uh, digested all the nutrients in that food, and that can wash into streams. And then another major source of nutrients to streams is wastewater treatment plants. So wastewater treatment plants take all the water from our houses and buildings and sewers and treat that water. So they remove any solid waste and they break down organic waste, and they can also remove some of the major pollutants in the water. But our wastewater has a lot of nutrients in it from organic waste and other sources, like even soap has a lot of nutrients in it, uh, that the wastewater treatment plants can't remove. And after treatment, that water is returned to streams and lakes, which means all those nutrients go back into the water. But nutrients can also come from our everyday lives. 
So we also use fertilizer on our gardens and on our lawns, which can wash into nearby surface water or, th or through the sewers to surface water. When we cut our lawns, grass clippings on the sidewalks and driveways can wash into surface water, where it'll then break down and contribute nutrients to the water. Waste from dogs and other pets can add nutrients to the water in the same way that the cow manure does. And even driving cars puts nitrogen into the air, which can eventually get into surface water through rain and through deposition. So there are lots of ways that we're putting nutrients into the water. So what happens when these excess nutrients from farms and wastewater treatment plants and all these other sources get into the water? Normally, the amount of water, the amount of algae in fresh water is limited by two things. First, the amount of nutrients in the water, and second, the animals eating that algae. Similar to farm crops, algae needs nutrients and phosphorus to grow. Sorry, nitrogen and phosphorus to grow. But there's only so much nitrogen and phosphorus in the water, which means that algae can only grow so much before it runs out of those nutrients. So there's only so much algae in the water naturally. But when more of those nutrients are added to the stream, algae growth is no longer limited. Algae can just grow and grow and grow. So streams and lakes end up with huge amounts of algae growing in them. And that algae can grow so much that it can actually turn the water this really thick green color. It kind of looks like pea soup. Uh, and this is what's called an algal bloom. So first off, algal blooms are pretty gross. <laughs> How many of you would swim in that water or even worse, drink that water? But algal blooms not only make the water look and smell gross, uh, but it can also actually be really dangerous to humans and pets and the animals living in the water. So this algae can produce toxins uh, that are dangerous to humans, uh, dangerous to dogs if they're swimming and drinking the water, and definitely dangerous to the animals living in that water. But it gets worse even after the algal bloom. So that algae eventually all dies and sinks to the bottom of the water. And once dead, the algae gets decomposed by bacteria and other microbes living on the bottom. And during decomposition, oxygen gets used up by the microbes. Now normally, decomposition, it's always happening. Things are dying and being decomposed. But at a normal rate, decomposition doesn't use up a significant amount of the oxygen in the water. Everything's sort of in balance. But after an algal bloom, there's so much algae decomposing all at the same time that the microbes are using up huge amounts of oxygen, way more than they would normally be using up. After this algae decomposes, the water has really low oxygen levels. Too much oxygen is used up during that decomposition. And this is a process called eutrophication. So eutrophication is when unusually high levels of nutrients cause excessive algal growth, and that leads to very low oxygen levels. Now fish, insects, and other animals, they all need oxygen in the water to survive in the same way that you and I need oxygen in the air to survive. So when oxygen is used up, they can no longer survive. So this lack of oxygen can cause huge numbers of fish and other animals to die. And when an event like this happens, it doesn't always stay in the area where it originated. Most water eventually flows into the ocean. So for example, say you have an algal bloom in the Ohio River in southern Ohio, so where that red dot is. Water from the Ohio River flows southwest into the Mississippi River, which eventually flows into the Gulf of Mexico. So nutrients that get into the Ohio River, they combine with nutrients that are being put into the Mississippi River over the entire length of both those rivers. And the nutrient concentrations build up until all those nutrients are dumped into the Gulf of Mexico. So nutrients from the upstream rivers have contributed to really high nutrient concentrations in the Gulf of Mexico. And these nutrient concentrations often result in eutrophication. So the colors here on this map show you the oxygen levels in the area of the Gulf of Mexico where the Mississippi River empties into the Gulf. The red areas indicate where there is little to no oxygen in the water. So most plants and animals can't survive when oxygen levels are this low. Animals that can move or swim like fish will avoid the area altogether. Plants and animals that can't move aren't able to survive in that area. So because there's really nothing living in it, 
It's often called the dead zone. So if you remember from earlier, nutrient pollution was one of the first leading causes of degradation of streams. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the second uh, leading cause of degradation, which is poor habitat quality. And there are many ways in which we have destroyed and altered streams to reduce the habitat quality. Uh, here you can see two examples of human modifications that have altered habitat and streams. So on the left here, you have what's called a culvert. And this is a tunnel or pipe that uh, allows water to flow under roads or railroads when they're constructed over a stream so that water can still get from one side of the stream to the other, even with a road going through it. On the right here, you have a channelized stream. And you'll often see these in really populated areas if a stream goes through it, um, like cities, it's really common to have this. What this is, is the sides and the bottom of the stream have been replaced with concrete in order con to control where the water goes. So normally streams will flood, they'll move around, but when you have houses, for example, right next to a stream, you don't necessarily want that happening. You don't want the houses flooding all the time. So a lot of populated areas will channelize the stream so that they can control where it goes and keep it from flooding houses and other developments. But these modifications are replacing normal stream habitat with concrete and other materials which plants and animals can't use in the same way as their normal stream. So they no longer have the habitat they would usually have to live and hide and hunt in. Another way that we contribute to poor habitat quality in fresh water is through deforestation. So normally you've got trees and you've got other plants that grow roots deep into the soil. And these roots make the ground more stable. They prevent the soil from moving away from the area like when it rains or when the wind blows. But when you cut down those trees to use for wood or for paper, there are no longer any roots holding onto that soil. And without those roots to stabilize and trap the soil, rain and wind can wash and blow that soil and find sediment into the stream in huge quantities. So usually, sorry. Usually the bottom of the streams are made up of pebbles and rocks of all different sizes. And these rocks provide holes and crevices for, other, for insects and other animals to hide in. So normally if you walk through a healthy stream, you're gonna find insects living under just about every rock you see and crayfish living in every hole between the rocks. Well then you get extra soil and sediment getting into the water and that sediment can fill up those holes and crevices. And that makes it difficult for the insects and crayfish and other animals to find places for habitat, places to hide, places to live. And if enough sediment gets into the stream, that sediment can actually completely cover the rocks and pebbles. So then there's nowhere for them to live. So they are completely lacking the habitat they need to survive in these streams. So even this, though this all seems pretty dire, what always amazes me is how resilient streams and other ecosystems are. So when the problem is minimized or removed, nature is really good at recovering and returning to its natural state. So what can we all do to minimize nutrient pollution and sediment pollution in freshwater and the ocean? One of the best things we can do is think carefully about how we manage our lawns and gardens. There's nothing wrong with fertilizing lawns and gardens, but only fertilize when it's necessary. Don't fertilize too often because the extra fertilizer will just wash away. It won't actually help your plants because it'll wash away, but it will hurt the streams and lakes that it washes into. When you cut your lawn, make sure that the grass clippings stay on the lawn rather than on the sidewalk or in the street. Clippings are much less likely to wash away if they're on the lawn, and if they're on the lawn, the nutrients will actually return to your lawn as the grass clippings break down, rather than washing into streams and contributing to nutrients. You can also minimize how often you drive. So instead, bike or walk whenever possible to reduce the amount of nitrogen you're putting uh, into the air from cars. And then always pick up after your pet so that none of that contributes to streams. And the last one you've all probably heard at least once, maybe a hundred times, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Whenever possible, reduce, reuse, and recycle. If we can minimize how much wood and paper we use, we can minimize the effect that deforestation has on streams. 
So an example of how you can reduce the amount of paper you use is by doing something like re using reusable towels that you can wash rather than using paper towels or napkins to clean. You can read electronic books or borrow books from the library instead of buying new books because books use up a lot of paper. You can think about whether you maybe could read something on the computer instead of printing it out to read. All of that can save paper so that we cut down fewer trees and there's less deforestation. And whenever you do need to use wooden paper, reuse it as much as you can and then recycle it whenever possible. There are also some things we can do as a society at a broader scale. So one of the biggest things we can do is change the way we farm. Think consciously about the way we farm. So similar to gardens, farmers need to think carefully about how much fertilizer they apply and when they apply it. It's also important to minimize the amount of nutrients and sediments that are entering streams from farms. So here you can see a farm where crops are planted all the way up to the stream's bank. It's really easy for fertilizer and sediment to wash directly from that field into the stream. So say the uh, field is fertilized and then it rains, it's really easy, easy for stuff to wash into the water. In order to prevent this, we can build what's called a buffer zone between the farm and the water. So a buffer zone is an area of plants, ideally native plants, that grows next to the river. So buffer zones can trap those nutrients and sediment that run off from the land before it gets to the water. So the plants in that buffer zone can use up some of those nutrients to help them grow, and they can also slow down the sediment to significantly reduce nutrient and sediment pollution. And this is something that can actually be done not just on farms, but even uh, in homes or any sort of development that's near a river. So any sort of development can contribute uh, sediment and nutrients to the water. So for example, homes that are on the river can, can plant native vegetation to prevent anything from washing over from their home into the river. So this can be done in lots of different ways. The best thing that I think each and every one of us can do, honestly, is learn to appreciate the freshwater ecosystems that surround us. In a lot of cases, we see these ecosystems day in and day out. We don't really think that much about them. So my challenge to you is to find a freshwater ecosystem nearby and just start paying attention to it. Explore it, see what kind of plants and animals live in and around that ecosystem. One of my favorite parts about being a scientist is just being out in nature and being able to observe it because I never know what I'll find. And it's always really interesting. So I encourage you all to continue, continue learning about freshwater ecosystems on your own by just seeing what's out there. So that's all I have for you guys today. So I'd like to open it up for questions. But before I take any questions, I want you all to know about the two conservation talks that Broadreach is having next week. Uh, so Kim will be presenting on beluga conservation on Monday at 11 a.m. And then Adam will be presenting on sea turtle conservation on Thursday at 1.30 p.m. I know I'm looking forward to both of those talks, so I hope to see you all there too. Thank you all so much for listening today. Uh, I'm really happy to be able to share some of the stuff that I'm so interested in, and I'm happy to take any questions that you guys all have. Thanks, Becca. I'm gonna paste in two questions that came across um, while you were talking, and then maybe that'll spark a couple other ones from the rest of us. Uh, so the first question from Kelsey <clears throat> was, what if the lake looks eutrophic, but uh, they have those species of larvae? Uh, yeah, so it can be very complex sometimes. So sometimes certain species are more um, adaptable to certain conditions than others. So it's not always so cut and dry of if this species is here, it's healthy, it's not, uh, it's not healthy. So it does get more complex than that. You really have to look at which species are present and their specific characteristics. But one really interesting thing that I think at least about, about looking at water is you can't always judge its health by looking at it. Sometimes you can, you know, if water is pea green, it's usually not a good sign. But um, this is actually also true with the ocean of sometimes you're looking at like really clear water it doesn't always mean it's healthier than dirty water. So dirty water can sometimes mean it has more nutrients and more algae in it. And that can be actually a really balanced system if that's how it's meant to be. Some systems just naturally have more stuff growing in them. 
Uh, so sometimes looking at it can actually be really hard to judge the cleanliness of the water. So if those species are present, maybe that's a sign that even if it looks a little maybe not ideal to humans, that it actually might be balanced in its own way, that it might be healthy in a way that maybe we don't understand. Uh, so the next question was from Lily. Is there a way that we can keep um, surface water clean and not affect the water and the animals? So um, I talked a little bit about some of the ways we can keep it clean. I think one of the most challenging things about water conservation is that you got to find a balance. There's no way for us to not affect the water. Humans living on Earth are going to affect the water. So I think the biggest challenge is finding that balance. So how can we ensure that we can be productive and happy and live our lives while simultaneously conserving the water around us? So that's why I think thinking consciously about the way we do things is the key to it. So, you know, we're not going to be able to never cut down any trees and never use any water and never pollute any water. But thinking about how we can minimize that as much as possible. So thinking carefully about how we fertilize our lawns and gardens and how we maintain our lawns and thinking consciously about how we farm and how we can do that to meet our needs but simultaneously protecting the water that we also rely so heavily on. Uh, so the next question from Kelsey was, do we do anything to take away algae during a bloom so that there aren't fish kills? Like, breaking the lake or river or something? That's a great question. Uh, I don't know too much, I don't know any cases where we've really actively tried to minimize a bloom once it's happened. Uh, it's pretty hard to get, it would take a lot of time and money to rake the lakes just because they're so big and algae gets everywhere. So it's gonna be in the surface water, it's gonna be deep down in the lake, it's gonna be growing on the rocks and the sediment on the bottom. Uh, so usually once an algal bloom happens, we usually sort of let it run its course and then try and prevent more of them in the future. Uh, so this is a great suggestion. There's a program called Adopt a Stream in most cities uh, and another one called Big Sweep. So these are annual cleanups. Um, which is a great, another great way to help streams, help clean up streams. So that's a great suggestion. Uh, Virginia had the question, how long do algal blooms last? It can vary a lot <clears throat> because it's not just about the nutrients. It's also about temperature and uh, current in, in the water and so many different factors. So they can last anywhere from a few days to most of a summer. In most cases, they'll last a couple weeks. Uh, and then go away. But it also depends on so many different factors, um, mainly the nutrients, but also the temperature is a big one. Uh, so the next one <clears throat> is, in your opinion, which is worse or more irreversible, a lake with an oversaturation of nutrients and algal blooms uh, or a dead zone? That's a great question. It's hard to answer because they're sort of connected because one leads to the other. So a dead zone is sort of like the most extreme end of an algal bloom. So algal blooms will usually, or if they get really bad, can cause a dead zone. So I would say a dead zone is more irreversible because it's more extreme than just an algal bloom. So one single algal bloom is definitely an indicator that something's wrong but it might mean you could turn it around quickly. So if you think carefully about what's causing it, you might be able to turn that around really quickly. Whereas if you've gotten all the way to a dead zone, there's gonna be a lot more work required to reverse that. Uh, so Kelsey asked, what is your favorite part about working in freshwater ecosystems? Uh, that is definitely my favorite question so far. Uh, I was very skeptical when I moved to freshwater ecosystems because marine ecosystems are amazing. They're so beautiful. I have always loved working in them and did not necessarily want to leave working in them, uh, but I got a great opportunity in freshwater. What has amazed me is it's not, the freshwater ecosystems, at least uh, where I work, 
are not always quite as showy as something like a coral reef, but there is just so much going on in them that I'm always seeing something new or learning something new. And that's my favorite part of like, when I first go to a stream, even if I have tons of work to do there, the first thing I like to do is just go and walk around and flip rocks and bring a net maybe and just see what I can catch. <clears throat> because there are so many unique things that I, especially I grew up on Long Island in New York. So I really didn't have a lot of fresh water growing up. I was mostly by the ocean. So I knew very little about fresh water when I moved to Ohio. Uh, so for me, there's just so many amazing new things for me to see uh, that I just love working there. Uh, so the next question from Lily is, do algal blooms happen everywhere or only in certain states or cities or countries? Um, <clears throat> they can happen anywhere. There's certainly no limit. Uh, generally, warmer places do tend to have more algal blooms because the algae that really thrives with nutrients, so different algae is better or worse at taking advantage of that nutrients. So there's a specific type of uh, nutrient of algae that's especially good at taking advantage of those nutrients quickly and really exploding. And that's called cyanobacteria. And they also particularly like warmer temperatures. So in warmer areas, if you get nutrients, you're more likely to have an algal bloom. It certainly can happen anywhere. So like uh, Lake Erie in Ohio has some of the biggest problems with algal blooms of anywhere in the country, <clears throat> just because Northern Ohio has huge uh, agricultural businesses that flow into Lake Erie. Um, so even though Lake Erie isn't especially warm, they have huge problems with it. So it can happen anywhere. Um, the next question was, where are good places to go to school for marine biology? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, if, if you're thinking about for undergrad, you don't necessarily need to go somewhere that's only specifically for marine biology. So for example, my undergrad didn't have marine biology. I studied biology and environmental studies and then moved on to a um, master's in marine biology. So don't, don't limit yourself too much when you're thinking about undergrad at least in that you only need to study marine biology because there are lots of opportunities like even though I didn't study marine biology, I worked in, in an aquarium my, in, in, in undergrad and got lots of opportunities to do stuff there. Um, but there are lots of great places to study marine biology. Uh, I went to Northeastern University for my master's and they had a really unique program where I got to study in Boston and then in Panama and then in Washington. So I really enjoyed that program a lot. Um, but there are tons of schools that have really great marine biology programs. Um, and the last question from Lily was, could it also happen in man-made lakes? Yes, definitely. Uh, so lots of um, lakes, especially in like the area where I live, are man-made lakes. They're usually made by dams put in a river to create a reservoir. And those are often created either to pre prevent the river from flooding or to provide um, water for cities. And it can absolutely happen in man-made lakes. In fact, it can often happen, man-made lakes tend to be less balanced in some ways because they're not naturally lakes, right? So they're, they're meant to be flowing water often and they're dammed and they're stopped from flowing and made into these lakes. So the communities in that system are used to flowing water and then are suddenly in stagnant lake water. So they're already sort of disturbed systems. So it can actually be easier for uh, algal blooms to, to start in man-made lakes than in natural lakes where the system sort of starts out a little more balanced. Uh, so the next question was, can you add oxygenators, bubblers, aerators, something to add oxygen to the water uh, when an algal bloom starts to try and prevent those fish kills since um, instead of letting the bloom just run its course on its own? Uh, that's a really interesting idea. I haven't heard of anyone actually trying that. Um, yeah, that would be an interesting idea. Yes, definitely. Um, here, I will put my email. Sorry, so the next question was, if we have more questions, could you email me? Uh, you are all more than welcome to email me uh, about questions related to this, about graduate school, about anything like that. So I am putting my email there. So feel free to email me. 
Awesome. It looks like our questions are dying down. If you have a dire question, go ahead and throw it in the chat. But that's so great. Thank you for sharing your email address, Becca. I know kind of sometimes since we have a moment to marinate on these things, more ideas pop into our heads. Yeah. Um, and of course, you all are always welcome to email us at BRHQ uh, as well, um, because then we can reach out to our awesome instructors like Becca to help answer your questions. <laughs> um, I certainly would not be able to have answered any of those questions on my own. Um, I'm also going to throw in the sign up links for Kim and Adam's presentations for next week. They'll be really awesome. Um, Kim and Adam both have some really unique experiences, kind of like how Becca has dived into this new world for us. We'll get to dive into some other worlds next week. Um, so I'll go ahead and throw those in the chat and keep the meeting open for another minute or two. But thank you so much for being here, everybody. And thank you, Becca, so much for your awesome presentation. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>